everyone. Good morning. Uh, our upcoming panel is on black lung in the 21st century. Although black lung sounds like a disease of antiquity, current research shows that black lung, black lung rates have skyrocketed. Dr. Scott Laney has described Appalachia as the epicenter of one of the largest industrial medicine disasters that the United States has ever seen. Black lung should not be a topic in the 21st century, but its resurgence in the coal fields presents not only a public health concern, but also an injustice needing legal and policy uh, uh, solutions for Appalachia. Uh, this interdisciplinary panel will introduce the spectrum of medical problems known as coal mine dust lung disease, discuss recent research showing an upsurge in severe black lung in Appalachia, cover existing laws providing compensation to minors and their families, and provide an overview of the major policy changes of the past decade. Our moderator for this panel is the Law Review's own Christine Pell. Thank you. Thanks, Alex, and thank you everyone for being here. Today we're going to hear from a tremendous panel of experts, and I don't use that word lightly, these truly are the experts in the field, um, about coal mine dust lung disease. Known widely as black lung, this has been called and truly is a mining disaster in slow motion. So I'd like to start by sharing a few lyrics from a song called The Devil is in the Dust. This is also the name of Mr. Smith's blog that he keeps on um, Black Lung. The song's by Ed Pickford. If I had known then what I know now, I wouldn't have been so keen to spend my working life in a coal seam. I'd have stayed above the ground and the air and sun, not digging where the devil has his home. The devil is in the dust that rises from the coal. It rages in your chest as it battles for your soul. And I believe that this passage really shows the deep impact that this disease has on individual Appalachians and their families. Um, a panelist has also asked me to share some phrases from the law on this subject, namely the original 1969 Federal Coal Mine Health and Safety Act, and it's about prevention. Congress declared that the first priority and concern of all in the coal or other mining industry must be the health and safety of its most precious resource, the miner. So this area of medicine, the law, is very complex, and the panelists would like to start with um, a background section to establish the facts and information before we get into um, a bit of a dialogue so we can hear their perspectives openly. And then I... I'm committed to leaving at least 10 minutes at the end for audience questions before we conclude. So for the background, each panelist is going to share a little bit about their area of practice and research. And as I introduce each, I've also asked to, um, for each of them to tell us their impetus of why they went into this field, why they chose this line of work, either when they first started or what causes them to feel passionate about keep doing it, keep doing it day in and day out. So first we have uh, Dr. Edward Lee Petzonk um, from the WVU School of Medicine. He's in the section of Pulmonary Critical Care and Sleep Medicine, and he is the former Chief Medical Officer at NI NIOSH, and he's going to share a little bit about this thing we call black lung disease. Well, thank you, Christy, and uh, thanks to uh, Evan and uh, the rest of the panel for, for asking me to be here and for you, to the audience. Um, I am a pulmonary physician. I grew up in Altoona, Pennsylvania. My dad was an electrician, and he uh, was an industrial commercial electrician, so he spent a lot of time in the coal mines and uh, other industries at that, which were prominent at that time up in, in Altoona, railroads and so on. Uh, that was sort of a little trigger for me because I worked with him and saw the conditions and so on, and it, it made, uh, made me start thinking about these, these issues. Um, I went to medical school. I uh, joined the public health service uh, right out of, uh, out of medical school and my internship uh, and uh, went out to the Indian Reservation and was a tuberculosis control officer and uh, field medical officer out there for a couple of years. Uh, went back and got my specialty training, and then came to to uh, Morgantown to be uh, working at the uh, uh, NIOSH laboratory here, the CDC lab where, where uh, Scott works. And so that's kind of, uh, 
I, I got into occupational lung disease and pretty much since then that's been my, my career. I worked uh, and have, I spent about 25 years at NIOSH uh, and about 15 years at the university and uh, been a clinician and a researcher uh, and I'm still active although I'm no longer uh, seeing patients as a primary physician. So uh, with that kind of background, uh, I have published a lot on occupational lung disease. Uh, we, in the past couple years, have tried to change the name of black lung pneumoconiosis and things like that to coal mine dust lung disease because we think that's more of an integrative understanding of what really happens. And of course, intrinsic in that is what causes it, and that is coal mine dust. Uh, one important point you can see here, uh, surface coal miners up in the upper left uh, and the dust that they're exposed to, the uh, miner operating a continuous mining machine and the dust that he's exposed to cutting the coal. Here's a transportation, the, the beltway. People work around the belts, get the same type of exposures. And here is probably one of the most hazardous uh, activities. That's called roof bolting where the miner here is drilling up and you can see the plate in the roof with the bolt on it that's holding up the roof because without that, when you take the coal out, that roof is gonna come down on the equipment in the miner. So this uh, involves cutting into silica rock, which is about 20 times more toxic per milligram than, uh, than coal per se. So let's go ahead. Now, what is black lung disease, or what is coal mine dust lung disease? And I show you on the left, this is an autopsy slice of a normal lung. There are a few little black streaks on it, but basically that's what a normal lung looks like. It's a sponge. The air comes into these very tiny air sacs. On the other side, you can see a fairly recent autopsy uh, slice of a, of a miner's lung. From This was from Morgantown. Uh, he had worked 17 years underground. And you can see, I think maybe I'll, I'll walk over here. Uh, these are the air tubes that take the air out into the lungs. And you can see the walls of those air tubes are yellow, thickened. And that is bronchitis, the dust that deposit on those airways uh, cause damage to the airways, preventing the air movement. Uh, you can see the black spots scattered throughout. That's what we call uh, simple pneumoconiosis where the dust gathers around the smallest airways and causes scar tissue in the airway. And in the adjacent lung, there's also emphysema. Uh, and you can see the emphysema is in this area. We, I, I make that Swiss cheese lung. Basically, the lung is dissolved. There's really no lung tissue there. They're just open spaces where there should be a good a functioning lung. And then that big black area at the top is what we're seeing so much of now and that Scott's going to be talking about. That is where the lung is basically solid scar tissue, black stained scar tissue. Nothing, no oxygen can get into the bloodstream in that area. That lung is gone. We call it progressive massive fibrosis because it is progressive. The miner doesn't have to inhale any more dust. They've got it locked in their lungs. It's a mass. It looks like cancer, but it is not. It's fibrosis, which is scar tissue. So these are the various types of, of diseases that, uh, that we group under the coal mine dust lung disease. Could we go to the next? And there are really three parts. The scar tissue or fibrotic tissue uh, destroys normal lung. The airflow diseases, uh, which you've probably heard of as COPD, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, and that prevents the movement of air in and out of the lung. It actually doesn't, that's not involving in the actual tissue itself. And then there are infectious diseases. Miners get more pneumonia, tuberculosis, and similar types of infection because you can see their air tubes are not able to prevent the infection from penetrating down into the deepest parts of the lung. So dust is the cause. You've probably heard about tobacco smoking it does not ever, I've never found one case where tobacco smoking has caused massive lung fibrosis like this, okay? That's a myth, throw it out, 
It's never happened, to my knowledge, it's never been reported in the medical literature. So tobacco is not good for you. No one should smoke. It can cause cancer, it can cause lung disease and so on, but it doesn't cause the problem that you're going to hear more about today. So that's uh, kind of a, and I, we can put up some more stuff, but I, I don't want to get too uh, specific here. Some of the fibrotic lung diseases are called pneumoconiosis, silicosis, mixed dust pneumoconiosis, dust-related diffuse fibrosis. They're the all group that cause scar tissue. The airflow diseases, I mentioned bronchitis, emphysema, and the, where the, the dust gets into these very small airways, it causes a blockage of those airways called mineral dust airways disease. So that's sort of what we're going to be talking about today is a, a, you know, a kind of a background. It is a disease that very much damages the ability of the lung to provide the oxygen to get rid of the carbon dioxide that you need to work in a mine or to do anything else. And these miners eventually require oxygen. Their heart, they go into heart failure because the heart needs oxygen and it cannot pump the blood around. So it, it has a tremendous impact and it, it often is fatal. So it's very disabling and fatal in its more advanced stages. So I'm going to stop there, but that's kind of what we're going to be talking about today. And um, if you have a moment, I was wondering if you could share with the audience what, what caused you to go into this type of practice or what you'd, you were talking last night about it. And I wanted just for you to share why this is your area of expertise. Well, uh, you know, it's a combination of things. It was the examples of my parents who were very community-minded and, you know, that I realized and I still believe that my career has been a tremendous uh, privilege. And I've worked with people from all over the world. I've done wonderful, interesting science, but I've always been focused on a problem that if I can solve it will help a lot of people. Did I uh, give up a financial benefit? Of course. I've always been a salaried person. I worked for the federal government for 25 years. I worked for the university. You don't. You probably make 25 to 50 percent of what you would make in a private practice setting or maybe even less depending on how. So, but yet I have had my, one of the most satisfying, I, I can't imagine more satisfying life, okay? So if, 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 you know, does everyone know Willie Sutton's law? Sutton's law? No? Sutton's law says, uh, Willie Sutton was a bank robber. They said, well, why do you rob banks? He says, that's where the money is, <laughs> okay? <laughs> and of course, that's true. And, you know, but there is more, much more to our professional lives, and that's why I am absolutely a happy camper for having chosen the direction that I have. Is that fair enough? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And next we have uh, Dr. Scott Laney. He's a research epidemiologist in the surveillance branch, the Division of Respiratory Health at the National Institute for Occupational Safety and Health, or NIOSH, which is just um, over the hill. And his research focuses on the causes and consequences of coal mine dust lung disease. He's going to talk a little bit about the epidemiology of the disease, the resurgence of it recently, and also the NIOSH program and history, and also why you chose this line of work. Well, <clears throat> epidemiology in general is a pretty poor business model. Um, the, whole, <laughs> the whole goal is to work very hard um, and put yourself out of business as quickly as you possibly can. And so you spend long periods of time uh, studying and learning about um, certain diseases, and then you work diligently to make them go away so you don't have to, to mess with that anymore. And fortunately, in my career, I've been a part of some diseases that we no longer have on Earth, um, and that's incredibly satisfying. Um, but when that happens, you have to find something else to do. Um, I looked at black lung pretty seriously about 10 years ago and said, this is an area where I think if I throw my back into it for a couple of years, we should have it no longer. And this will spike the football and be done with it. Um, and of course, that's, that's not the case um, at all. So a little bit about 
how we know that there's a resurgence is because we follow this disease very closely and have for the last 50 years. Back in the 1950s and 60s, if you spent your whole career as a coal miner, you could expect to have about a 50% chance of retiring uh, with black lung disease if you hadn't been blown up or crushed to death in the meantime. Um, and miners were getting fed up with this um, and organized and went on strikes. Um, and in 1968, there was a uh, coal mine disaster, an explosion, um, very near here, down in Fairmont, um, that killed 78 miners. This wasn't really particularly remarkable because we've had a number of explosions throughout history. The thing that made this particular uh, explosion um, remarkable was it was the first time that it was nationally televised. And so with the worker movement, with this national outrage over seeing these men being burned up in this, in this coal mine, um, it coalesced to create the Federal Coal Mine Health and Safety Act that was passed in Congress in 1969. And a couple of key provisions of that act was that it established for the first time permissible dust exposure limits that miners could be um, exposed to and it directed NIOSH to uh, conduct routine health surveillance. To Part of what you mentioned, which is we study the causes and consequences of, of coal mine dust lung disease was established through this act. And, one of our primary tasks is to administer the uh, x-ray surveillance program. So miners can get an x-ray at about every five years throughout their entire working career at no cost to themselves. And um, the reason for that is for early identification of the first stages of black lung disease so we can stop it from progressing to progressive massive fibrosis. Um, and there's a there's a way to do that by identifying it early, and then there's uh, what's called Part 90 transfer rights. So if a miner has evidence of black lung disease in its early form, they can be removed from that environment and go to a less dusty uh, part of the mine if they choose to, to use that transfer right. So we have 50 years of information since we've been collecting it on these miners. We have about a million x-rays that we can look at over this time period. And as you might expect, after we put in these regulations for the first time, disease rates dropped precipitously. And so from about 1970 to the late 1990s, we had a continued decline in the amount of black lung disease to the point with progressive massive fibrosis that it was nearly eradicated at the end of the, the 1990s. In 2014, we published a report that um, sort of shocked the scientific community with regards to progressive massive fibrosis, where we showed that from about 2000 to 2014, the rates had dramatically increased to the same level um, that we had seen since we started tracking this in 1970. And this sort of um, became known as the U-shaped curve, because what had happened is it had gone down, bottomed out to having gone away, um, to spiking back up. And this, this week, there's a lot of reporting in the New York Times, NPR. If you Google black lung, you'll see it's all over the place. Um, we've recently, in the last year, um, have had to change the name of this particular curve from a U-shaped curve to a J-shaped curve, where we now see the highest rates of progressive massive fibrosis um, in history that's ever been um, recorded. And so that's... Um, that's what we're seeing right now with regards to the most severe form. We're also seeing that um, simple coal workers pneumoconiosis has increased from the year 2000 in all tenure categories um, throughout the United States, both in central Appalachia and in the rest of the United States. So that's where we currently are with regards to black lung. And we'll talk a little bit about um, their, the panelists' perspectives on why and what can be done for policy and medical and legal changes in the future. Um, next we have Evan Smith, he is an attorney at the Appalachian Citizens Law Center in Whitesburg, Kentucky. He represents coal miners and families in black lung and mine safety cases, and he focuses on policy advocacy, appellate advocacy, and impact litigation. He's going to talk a little bit about what happens after um, a miner has um, 
coal mine dust lung disease, sure. the benefit and, system. Um, and before I start in, I want to thank not only all my co-panels, but particularly Christy. She has done a terrific job um, kind of jumping into all the jargon, all the complex stuff that, you know, the, that John, Scott, and Lee and I kind of spend all day working on. And anyway, she's been terrific, as, as have all of the organizers of this symposium and everyone else at the law review. So um, I, want to, I want to thank all of them right away. So I'm also, I'm very happy that there's that a good proportion of the audience here are law students. So I kind of want to pull back and talk very broadly about, you know, legally, you know, what, what do you do once you get some of these, you know, horrible diagnoses of black lung like, um, like Lee and Scott have been talking about. So, you know, many of you have taken your torts classes, so you kind of think, oh yeah, this is kind of like asbestos litigation or something, you know, that there should be some way that this, the industry players get sued. But then, you know, there, it's actually what ended up happening at the same time that in 1969 when the federal Coal Mine Safety and Health Act was passed, they also created this federal black lung benefit system. So the, the simplest way to think about it is it's essentially a federal, a specialized federal workers' compensation system. So much like the workers' comp laws of all the 50 states where workers give up their right to sue their employer and tort, and instead they have this kind of specialized administrative system where you, you know, go and try to prove that you have this disease and it's occupationally related. There's a similar thing at the federal level for black lung. It's, um, there's a long complex history of it, and I kind of won't go through all that, but it's currently administered by the Department of Labor. And so there's a whole system through which, you know, you, if you're a worker, you're, you know, you're a coal miner, and you think that you might have some breathing problems related to black lung, you file a claim, the Department of Labor provides you with uh, a complete medical exam that's paid for by the Department of Labor, and then, uh, and then there's a quit. Then you kind of get the results of that. At the same time, the Department of Labor they determine what company should maybe be liable for your benefits, and it's you know there's some nuance to it, but it's roughly speaking the last company that you worked for at least a year. And so you have, unlike, say, Social Security benefits litigation, <coughs> this is adversarial litigation where, on the one hand, you've got, you know, a coal miner who feels like they are medically entitled to these benefits, and on the other hand, you have a coal company or an insurance company that is kind of taking care of defending them in these claims that is saying, no, we should not have to pay this person. Uh, either because, hey, you got the wrong guys. You actually should be, this other company should be involved, and or this person, this coal miner is not actually medically entitled. Um, so let me just briefly talk about what it means to be medically entitled for black lung benefits. Now, the, at the kind of most intuitive level, you would say, okay, if you go to the doctor and you get this kind of diagnosis like Lee or Scott was talking about, that should then you should you have black lung, so you should get some black lung benefits, right? I wish uh, that the, instead you have to not only have black lung, but you also have to be suffering from a respiratory disability. So not just kind of a disability generally. Your back can get broken in the mines, and you can still not be considered disabled for black lung benefits purposes. It has to be a, a disability having to do with your breathing system, and so. Um, it, what that functionally means is that you, you not only have to have black lung, but it has to be affecting you in a very severe way. Uh, there are innumerable coal miners that walk into our office, definitely have black lung, definitely, you know, when you're around them, you can tell they can't breathe right. But there's some, you know, when they go for the medical test, there's some kind of numbers in these tables that you look for, and these guys don't quite hit the numbers. And so, in that sense, a lot of what the reality of black lung benefits law is, especially now, and I can talk about why now is a little bit different than, you know, a decade ago, it's, it's often more like a disability law system than, you know, this, just this question about if you look in the lungs, what do you see? So, um, 
I, I can, I'll talk more about kind of the, in a little bit, some of the legal changes. And I can also speak about um, kind of what, why I think this is an interesting area of law to practice in. Because that's one of the, the, the two main takeaways that I hope people have here is first off, the knowledge that this disease is not a thing of the past that this is something that's actually, as Scott said, we're on a J-shaped curve. It's, it's worse than it was in the past. And so black lung is going to be a reality for people in West Virginia and other places in the American coal fields for decades more to come. Even if we can you know, clean up the conditions in coal mines now and make future exposures not so bad, there have been people that have been working in the mines for the past decades that are going to continue to suffer from this for decades. And so those people need legal assistance. And they're, in these cases, unlike often in the past, are now quite winnable. And so I, I want to talk about that and why it can be. So it, it's an area of practice that I very much enjoy. And so to touch base on Christie's kind of question she was tacking on to this about, well, why, why do I do this? Or what is it that brought me to this work? Um, as a little bit of background, so I grew up in the coal fields of eastern Kentucky, uh, a town called Whitesburg, which is in Letcher County, and it's just across a mountain from Harlan County. So if you kind of try to imagine, you know, what I'm like, it's, it's basically Harlan County, just the other side of the mountain. And so I grew up, um, my paternal grandfather was a coal miner, an underground coal miner. And uh, my maternal grandfather, though, was an attorney and actually did a lot of black lung benefits defense litigation, also mine safety defense litigation. So I've kind of, uh, my sort of ancestral history can kind of, you know, it's, it's often all been about coal, as often many of us growing up in the coal fields have been, and there's, you know, we've had different perspectives on this. Now, when I decided to go to law school later in my life, I had, I started law school in 2009, and at that point I had basically zero interest in black lung stuff. I mean, kind of like Scott was saying, I just had this perception of like, this stuff's done. And actually it was um, early in the Obama administration, there was this big effort, they were calling it In Black Lung Act Now. And so there's, I remember like, you know, seeing the stickers that miners could put on their hat about it and some of the relics out of this. And so I sort of had this perception of, well, by the time I'm finishing law school, that's not gonna be anything that you're gonna need to be working on. But then, of course, when I actually did finish, we were starting to see this uptick. And particularly when I finished clerking in 2013, there was a real clear sense that there was a need for this work. And so I, I came into it um, in part because I saw this need, but also there was a lot of intrinsic things I liked about it. I mean, I like administrative law. I like appellate law, you know, and, I, and this is, that's what black lung benefits litigation fundamentally is for the most part, is that in many ways it's like a workers' comp law or a disability law, but as I can talk about more later, there's lots of appeals, you know, there's some kind of complex administrative law stuff going on, and you know, the law nerd in me just loved that stuff. And so that, that brought it to me, and at the same time, I was able to serve my neighbors and get into an, inter an interesting issue area. Thank you. And then last but not least, we have uh, Mr. John Klein. He is a WVU College of Law graduate who has worked on behalf of coal miners since the formative period of federal black lung laws. Um, he currently practices in Beckley, and he has been involved in some of the most difficult and, con and contentious cases of the, the past decade. He's going to talk about the importance um, of legal representation in this area, and then also, um, Hopefully you can share a little bit of your background and how you came to be this type of attorney. Thank you. I grew up in a small town in western New York State and I came to West Virginia um, 50 years ago uh, this month um, in February of 1968 and as a, vi as a young VISTA volunteer. And uh, it was a very inspiring time to be in West Virginia. Uh, there was um, just a lot going on with black lung. Despite strong opposition, miners had formed the West Virginia Black Lung Association with an office in Charleston. 
chapters in almost every West Virginia County, or at least every Southern West Virginia County, strong support from United Mine Workers locals, small strategy meetings, large rallies, and one local president, Charles Brooks, had taken out a $5,000 mortgage on his own home to retain a lawyer named Paul Kaufman to draft the first state legislation to recognize black lung as an occupational disease. Um, I don't know, do you have those pictures? Oh, yeah. or? Should I do the first one? Yeah, you can just show them both. These pictures are of a large rally in March up uh, Canal Boulevard in Charleston to the state capitol later in 1968. And with roving pickets, um, you know, go ahead and just show the others. But this was, you know, I mean, it was organized, but it was organized by rank and file miners. It wasn't, uh, you don't see any fancy signs, um, you know. And these guys were all on strike. And with the roving pickets, the Black Lung Association and the, had brought the West Virginia coal industry to a virtual standstill. And the West Virginia Black Lung Law was passed in 1968, ahead of the Federal Act, recognizing black lung as an occupational disease. And then, of course, as Scott said, the next year, um, and Christy said, um, Following the explosion at Farmington and the threat of another national coal strike, Congress passed and President Nixon signed the Federal Black Lung Health and Safety Act. This was a huge step, not only for West Virginia, but for the nation, because this occupational health and safety movement led to MSHA, NIOSH, OSHA, all of those things followed on the heels of the Federal Mine Health and Safety Act. <clears throat> And in 1970 and 71, I continued to work part-time with the Black Lung Association, but then I switched gears and worked as a carpenter and an electrician until uh, 1987, for about 15 years. And then I went back to working with coal miners as a benefits counselor in one of the black lung clinics that the United Mine Workers had organized. Um, at that time, it was very hard for miners to get a lawyer to represent them in a federal black lung claim. I mean, there were just, there was nobody in the county where I live or any of the immediately surrounding counties that were still taking those cases. And a miner named Ralph Manning asked me one evening if I would please take a look at his case. And I remembered that back in the 70s, um, um, Apple Red, which was the um, predecessor to West Virginia Legal Aid had trained some lay people to represent coal miners, and I thought, well, how hard could this be? You know, I can do it. Well, I soon learned. <laughs> um, in uh, well, I started to say in 1991, Ralph Manning asked me if I'd look at his case, and I thought that, and I agreed to do it. Um, and what I found was Mr. Manning showed up um, with the next day with a huge box of papers, and I spent the next seven nights going through those trying to make sense of them. And I spent the next eight years working on his case. I didn't finish until I was here in law school in 19 or 2000. Um, unfortunately, uh, Mr. Manning had died by then. We, we did prevail in the case, but he had died and the benefits went to his widow. So that was an, my initial lesson in the complexity of these cases. And I'll just mention one other case. Uh, Charles Caldwell came into the office one afternoon and asked me if I would review <clears throat> um, the report he had gotten from an employer exam by Dr. George Saldivar. And he showed me a history and physical report, a pulmonary function test results, and the results of an arterial blood gas study. And I said, oh, Charles, I think you may have left some of this at home because there was not an x-ray reading and Dr. Saldivar's narrative report was missing. So he said, no. He said, that's all I got. So then I thought, well, maybe the uh, uh, coal company's attorney had omitted it. So I sent a letter asking for it and didn't get a response. I, I think I made two phone calls and didn't. And I eventually got it with the help of a, an administrative law judge that issued a show cause order and they had to cough it up. But 
it, it taught me an important lesson. Um, at that time, there were no evidentiary limits, and so coal companies had, with greater resources, could flood the record with uh, 15 or 20 x-ray readings um, and multiple reviewing opinions. Um, and so it taught me to start thinking about, instead of what all we're up against, to look at what's missing. And I started figuring out that there often was some stuff missing that was uh, significant. And uh, if I could figure out what that was and get it, I might be able to turn some of these cases around. So I essentially made a career out of trying to do that. And um, we ended up with a disclosure rule eventually. Um, I came here to law school in 1999, and uh, Professor McDermott was nice enough to let me continue doing black lung work in the clinic, even though the clinic didn't do black lung work. Professor Bastris helped me do my first Fourth Circuit appeal, and we lost, but it was a valiant effort, <laughs> in kind of an obscure area. Um, Oh, and in 1996, before I came to law school, I was fortunate enough to get to work with the Black Lungs um, uh, Legal Practice Clinic at Washington and Lee, and that was quite an education for me also. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. I want to go through some uh, points that each of you made to, to kind of help clarify. Um, but first, um, in speaking before this panel, the panelists shared with me some other myths about um, coal mine dust lung disease that I think that if, if you'd like, we can go ahead and debunk them. Um, as Dr. Petsonk said, that cigarette smoking, people a lot of times ask, well, could this be caused by something else? Um, it's established that this disease is caused by coal. But some of the other um, questions you hear just out and about are, is this problem concentrated in certain areas of the country? or with um, certain mine operators or coal seams, for example? Anybody can answer this one. <laughs> so we've done some recent work on, on addressing that. Clearly, the, the most significant increases in uh, the disease prevalence is in central Appalachia, in Kentucky, Virginia, and West Virginia, southern West Virginia. Um, but we see increases in uh, the prevalence of disease everywhere where coal is mined. So we've recently conducted a study completely eliminating Appalachia from our analysis, and looked at the western coal fields. Everywhere that coal is mined in the United States, you can find black lung. Um, did, do miners play a role in this? Is there any sort of contributory negligence? Like, are they not wearing their masks, for example? I'll let you take that one. <laughs> um, that sounds plausible, doesn't it? I mean, uh, you know, these guys don't wear their masks, they get what they deserve, so to speak. Except that from the science point of view, it doesn't make sense for several reasons. Number one, uh, any industrial hygienist, any professional in keeping the workplace safe will tell you that masks are the least reliable way of preventing dust exposure, least reliable, should not be relied on. And in fact, the coal mine uh, regulations specify that masks cannot be used as a means for meeting the safe air requirements. They cannot be used. So a mask, a miner can wear a mask if he or she chooses, but it is not required it, it, and it probably doesn't help. Why doesn't it not, not help? Oh, it's a fairly complicated, except that, let's say this, that masks have a certain uh, benefit. Maybe they are 95, you've probably heard of an N95, that try to take 95% of the dust out of the air. And when they're perfectly sealed, uh, they will do that. But in a coal mine situation, there are two things that totally defeat why a mask will work. Number one, it has to be perfectly sealed. No coal miner can sit there with his head upright and so on. If he has to talk to somebody, he's got to pull that mask down. And often they're on their hand, hands and knees because their seams are low. Uh, and certainly in these settings, masks are just not practical. They really don't work. Uh, secondly, 
Masks really are only useful in industrial settings where there's a predictable exposure. In other words, if you get rid of 95% of the dust, you will have a safe environment. But the dust that's generated in coal mines will change minute by minute as the mine environment changes. The type of rock, the toxicity of the dust, and the ability to get the air moving and so on, it all varies minute by minute. It's an unusual work environment. It's not like a factory where you really can have everything bolted on the floor. So for all these reasons, that is a myth that has been used and by used by people who know better, but it just is not, it's not rational scientifically. And this is an area where miners faced, another area where miners faced a double jeopardy because um, the manufacturers of the dust mass engineers had told them that these masks did not work in the field, and yet they continued to market them um, to coal companies, and miners used them hoping it would do some good, and, the, and uh, they didn't. Um, and there are a lot of uh, dust mask cases against the manufacturers that are being settled across the country now. Yeah, yes, and John Simon, there's all these product liability suits. They're saying that you can't sue your employer you know, when you get black lung, but those people that sold the dust mask and, you know, marketed them, at least they're going to, there's a whole kind of world of tort law that's, that's actively going on. And kind of somewhat ironically, uh, for a lot of the coal miners we work with, they could potentially get a whole lot more money from the people that made the, you know, defective dust mask than they can through the black lung benefit system, which has much probably to do with the fact that the black lung benefit system doesn't provide enough compensation uh, but anyway, there's, there's, a, there's a whole world of lawyers to do that. And then the, one other thing I want to add that's kind of related to the dust mask issue is that I think we should remember that uh, black lung is not the only risk related with dust ex you know, high dust levels in a mine. And the, it, the, because coal mine dust is combustible, then there are multiple reasons that you want to keep dust levels low in mines. Yeah. And so the most, you know, kind of egregious example that is unfortunately still of recent memories, Upper Big Branch. You know, when, when you have dust levels that are too high, then once you have some ignition source, you can have just really tragic consequences. And so the idea that we could kind of not worry about keeping the dust levels low in the mines, instead each individual kind of protects their own lungs, you know, for, and on top of what, you know, Lee's saying, on top of the problems with the dust masks that have been sold, still does not really protect the workers. Um, you mentioned the recent upper Big Branch mine. I think that's the, um, the disaster where they did autopsies, am I correct? Um, before we go to the next um, myth, I'm wondering if you can talk about the result of those autop autopsies and maybe how they can point to some of the explanations for um, just what, what they found in the length of the uh, miners' career and those sorts of things that have taught us new things about black lung, and for anyone. You want to do it, or I'm, I'm happy to. Oh, go ahead. But, you know, it was a tragic disaster. Uh, young people being destroyed, uh, but some of their bodies were still intact enough for, an, for autopsies to be done. A lot of them were not. But when they looked in the mines, in the lungs of these miners who were killed in the explosion, surprisingly, they found 71% had black lung. And these were working miners, some of them had only worked for 10 years or less, and they, and they had black lung. So that was uh, evidence of what the miners tell me when I hear, talk to them as a physician or as a, as a researcher, they say, oh, I work in an outlaw mine. What does that mean? Well, we know we don't obey the rules, okay? Now, why would a miner allow that to happen, okay? Hmm. And, I mean, it's, yeah. it's a question that a, 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 a lay person would say, yeah, why, not, why would you? Well, let me just tell you about one patient, okay? He was a miner, I think 50, 51, he lived in his mother's house. He never left home. He was her source of support. His salary was her support. Lived in a rural area about south of here, 
50 miles or so. He had an eighth grade education. His life was very simple. He really was not much of a talker. He was just a quiet person. He worked obviously satisfactorily because he had worked for 20 odd years in the mine. And, you know, he came to me because he couldn't breathe and his, his chest x-ray looked bad. And I said to him, you know, you gotta, you gotta get out. He says, I, I can't, there's nothing else that I can do. I've gotta keep supporting my mother. She's been there for me for all my life. And I, I said, well, you know, don't they do dust levels in your mind? He said, well, when they measure the dust levels, my boss tells me, you get an easy day, go over in this clean air area where the fresh air is coming in. You don't have to work today, just stay there and your pump will look good, okay? He couldn't say no to that because he knew his boss was telling him that and, it, and you know, how could he say no? You know, eventually he could no longer work. He was hospitalized and, you know, he, uh, uh, you know, never, never even really spoke out against this thing. But I, you know, there is something called uh, Part 90. Now, we're going to talk about Part 90. Yeah, can I was going to ask that next, please. Yeah. Can Before, I just say can, one yeah, thing? Yeah, go ahead. I, want, I wanted to say something. When, I don't know if this is a good analogy or not, but if you work in a law firm and the senior attorney is telling you to do things that are unscrupulous, and you say, I don't think I should do that, and they say, there's the door. Um, you know, that's the kind of situation miners were in. If you don't want to, you know, if you complain about the dust, there's a door. For some of these renegade companies, not all of them, but some of them. And the same thing happened to inspectors. I would hate to be an, an MSHA inspector in, this, in some of these situations, you know. Screw yourself. Get out of here. We're mining coal. We're paying severance tax. We're... I'd just like to say that some of the most more recent work that we've been uh, doing that's been led by David Blackleaves here um, has made it clear to me that this isn't sort of a bad apple odd occurrence. Um, the story that you just told, unfortunately, we've heard over and over and over again. Um, and way too much frequency. So um, that's not just one, one story. Um, I'm wondering, Scott, maybe you mentioned um, the NIOSH program. Uh, minors can do a, vol it's voluntary to get this x-ray and if there is early evidence of a disease, then they're part of something called Part 90 where they can be transferred to another less dusty area. And um, I wanted to kind of another blame game myth, uh, it's the question of minor participation in this. Um, what happens if you participate? Um, what, um, and anybody can speak to this f for their clients too, um, is it adverse to individuals? Maybe it, it should be required? Well, let me just give you the, the data and then these guys can talk to, to those questions. Um, Participation in the x-ray program where minors can go and get their chest x-ray about every five years. That fluctuates over the course of the last 50 years, but it's generally uh, currently for the last 10 year period between 30 and 40 percent of the entire nation's coal miners go and get their x-rays when they're supposed to. Um, and so we have a pretty good notion that the information that we're presenting is, uh, is accurate. When it comes to part 90 of the people that have pneumoconiosis who can transfer. Um, nationally, about 14% of those uh, individuals will use their uh, transfer rights, and it's much less than that in uh, central Appalachia, in fact. So even though they have um, the ability to transfer to a less dusty environment, uh, by and large, they choose uh, not to identify themselves to the company um, and take those rights. And uh, maybe you guys can talk some about the reasons sure. why. And, and let me first talk about, so uh, when we're saying part 90, it's, you know, when you go to 
Title 20 of the Code of Federal Regulations. It's part 90 of that. So that's sort of what the term communities for. So that's where it's embodied in the regulations. But it also, again, comes from, you know, the, there were some statutory changes that allowed that. And essentially what, it, what the law allows is for a minor who has gone through a certain process and has this confirmed diagnosis of black lung, then, they're, then they get this letter. It's kind of an opt-in ability, and then they can exercise that right, and then they are required to work in a less dusty part of the mine at the same rate of pay they were previously getting. Because the general dynamic and something that, you know, and a pure economist might say makes perfect sense is that often the workers that get paid the highest rates will work in the dustiest parts of the mine. They're right there at the face. You often, the people who are operating that continuous miner, they need to be very highly skilled people that really know how to do that because you know, there's a whole lot of reasons that, can be, that job is difficult to do. But if that guy's not doing his job well, no, the whole system doesn't work. So a good continuous miner is often one of the highest paid people, but they're also right there where the dust is being exposed. And so the Part 90 right would allow someone like a continuous miner operator to move away from that job Go to a less dusty job where they're, you know, uh, what, what miners often call out by work, doing some work away from the face, but still get that minor man rate of pay. Um, so it's in the, on paper it says, hey, this is a great system. It's a way that we identify the people with the problem and keep them from getting sicker, but still allow them to take care of their moms or, you know, whatever they need that paycheck for. Um, but as Scott also said, six out of seven people that get that letter, the people with the confirmed diagnosis of black lung, are not using their right. That's just a kind of fact on the ground. And there's a lot of good reasons that people don't. And it saddens me to say that because I want, you know, I want minors to do this. And I, I don't even want these guys to be my clients. I want the system to work and them not to need lawyers. But, uh, but instead, what often happens is that there is some type of retaliation in the workplace. There's some type of discrimination that happens. And so, actually, statutorily, the coal mine health and safety has a, a good anti-discrimination provision. There's, you know, if you look at it compared to a lot of other discrimination provisions, legally, it's, it's quite good. But factually, it can be hard. Because what you're asking this individual who's trying to take care of his mom and you know, often maybe only has an eighth grade education, you're sort of telling him, yeah, I want you to put your paycheck on the line, and maybe as your lawyer, I'll eventually be able to help you. And that's, that's a hard thing to get most working people to do in these situations, especially where more often than not, you know, that we can talk about kind of the history of the coal fields and the power that the coal industry has exercised over these communities. That's definitely part of it, but in addition, yeah, you might, you might give your letter to your foreman at this company, and you might have a good discrimination case because you've got a clear time when you gave them notice and all this. But then later on, that company might be closed. And then maybe just someone else that was around is the new boss. And then it gets harder to prove that this other person really knew you had black lung. And you can get in some difficult situations of proving these cases. I mean, not, you don't win all these discrimination cases. And so it, there's some risks there. And at the same time, the most that these minors can get when they win a discrimination case is the same paycheck they would have gotten if they kind of just kept their head down. And so it's, um, there, there are good reasons that minors don't do it, and I hate to say that, but it, but it is one of the realities. And the Part 90 system does not work in practice as well as it does if you kind of pull back and read about it from here in the law library. I think some of it varies between companies and uh areas too. I've represented quite a number of miners that have exercised that right without um, having an adverse effect. But for all of the ones I represented, their disease was too far along and I don't think it really did them much good. <clears throat> That's the other thing that I didn't mention is that since this epidemic has started, we're seeing the disease progressing very fast. And what, at one time, the idea of, well, stop your dust exposure, cut it back in half now, and that's going to prevent you from getting bad disease down the road. Uh, we believe that the dust inhalation is so great now that by the time you have x-ray confirmation of black lung disease, you probably have 
so much dust in your lung that you are never going to be able to prevent it from going to disability or death. So it's not, it's not entirely, at, the, at this current time, the biology of the disease is so aggressive that it's, that this system probably isn't going to be very effective anyway. I and hope we're not making, giving you the impression, though, that <coughs> it's a death sentence for every minor. Um, no. It's, you know, like smoking, only a certain percentage of us are susceptible to the severe effects of it. And with coal mining, too, there are still a lot of coal miners that are able to mine for a career that aren't uh, terribly impaired anyway. So this disease has been known for 300 or more years. Um, the medical community has been studying this for 100 years. You would think that yeah. <laughs> we would have a really firm foundation in understanding the biology and the natural history of this disease. And what Lee is saying is that perhaps we have uh, something new, new manifestations, uh, rates of progression that we wouldn't anticipate. And so there's a lot of things that um, we thought we knew about this disease that are challenging um, our previous assumptions. Um, so talking about diagnosis and understanding the disease, um, I wonder if you can talk a little bit about, so obviously a big part of making a black lung claim is the medical evidence, which um, displays why having an attorney representation is so important. Um, but often minors struggle to um, provide such med medical evidence when it comes down to a battle between the physicians um, in the court cases. So um, there has been um, a unique history in the Black Lung Program about the battle of the doctors. Um, and in terms of diagnosing the disease, understanding the di disease, and misdiagnosing the disease, um, John Hopkins University entire black lung program was shut down due to some uh, a scenario involving um, more than a thousand likely misdiagnosis and I was wondering if anyone wants to share about um, some of the problems with the former black lung program there and Dr. Wheeler and how um, how it has impacted um, the law in terms of medical disclosure. I think all of them probably have, have thoughts have on that. Have you heard of this topic, John? <laughs> John <laughs> was one of the he, key um, players. In, in he this. said earlier, we ended up with a disclosure rule eventually. <clears throat> and that, that disclosure rule is big, and it happened for um, a pretty horrible reason. So. Well, those are two different issues, really. One, the problem with the Johns Hopkins Black Lung Unit and Dr. Wheeler, and he was the head of the unit, so there were some other radiologists there that were reading in similar ways. Um, but they were not following the intended way of interpreting um, x-rays under the ILO classification system. You're supposed to identify irregularities that could be black lung. You don't know for sure that they are, but they could be. They're consistent with. And then if you want to say something about what the ideology is, you can at a lower point in the form. But what Dr. Wheeler was doing is saying, I don't think, he had a very narrow perception of what he thought black lung looked like. And if it wasn't fitting that specific mode, he ruled it out. Um, it's also, it was sort of like for, it's so frustrating because it was like the emperor has no clothes. We, we, we knew he was full of crap, but, you know, battling this on individual cases, you have the prestige of Johns Hopkins behind it, although I don't know that they were paying attention to what this was, but it was a cash cow for them, for sure. They were getting, we normally pay, I'm still paying $80 to get an x-ray reading. I think the more common figure would be around 100 or a little more. Um, can I just clarify when you say I still pay? You mean for your clients? For your clients, yeah. Um, trying to provide and obtain medical evidence for the client to a make the benefits. Of an X -ray, claim. Yeah. Um, when you say it was a cash cow, who they were was pa paying? Coal companies were paying the Johns Hopkins Black Lung Unit. I'm not sure if I remember the figures now. Seven hundred for an abnormal X-ray reading, and I've forgotten how much for a 
CT scan, but it was so far <coughs> beyond the market value that uh, they knew what they were getting. Um, so that, you know, that just, Dr. Wheeler said that he learned from a doctor uh, from Johns Hopkins named Dr. Morgan that had a role four decades ago in setting up a training program for NIOSH, was it? Um, well, Dr. Morgan was an expert in imaging, not black lung. So the idea that he learned from somebody who didn't know himself, you know, was illogical, but uh, like I said, it was tough. And uh, we were fortunate. Uh, a very tough investigative reporter named Chris Hamby did uh, expose that. Um, we were doing it on a case-by-case -case basis, but he did it in a way that embarrassed Johns Hopkins enough that they shut the unit down. The disclosure rule, um, going back to the Caldwell case, um, you know, does an employer have a right to withhold evidence that um, shows evidence of disease, uh, medical opinions that, or, or x-ray readings or pathology reports? And Evan and I were part of a group of lawyers that strongly advocated that that was inconsistent with the act of protecting the health and safety of minors that you talked about earlier. And I'll just read one sentence from a letter we wrote to the Secretary of Labor um, that we believe that the disclosure of all radiographic readings, pathology findings, cardiopulmonary test results, and the complete report of an examining physician is necessary in order to, one, protect the health and safety of minors, and two, to preserve the integrity and remedial purpose of the Black Lung Act. Um, and I think that capsulized it pretty well, and the Department of Labor had seen enough and heard enough about abuses um, that they agreed and they passed a rule requiring And I want to just kind of interject and kind of, in a broad legal context, kind of locate where the debate had been. So, um, as often as the case, you're involved in litigation, so both sides are kind of, you know, thinking about what expert evidence they might want to use. You're shopping around different experts. And what, what was going up, what kind of the debate is that um, an attorney or law firm would develop evidence from certain doctors, and then they'd be like, ooh, this hurts my client. And so then they would say, well, this is, you know, attorney work product. You know, and, and there's a whole kind of doctrine around, you know, when attorneys can hire accountants, you know, for these specialized areas. And so then they would say, we can just put this in our file and you can s serve discovery requests on us. In fact, you know, arguably even, you know, you, the judge could order you to produce it. And you can just be like, nope, nope, this is privileged. You can't make me produce that. And so there was, there was a whole, you know, there was a long period of litigation. And this was often happening in a case-by-case -case context. So it depended on having, you know, an attorney like John who, you know, put the time into this, was aggressive and wouldn't take no for an answer. When they would just, when you get a discovery response and they would just kind of say, you know, uh, object on basis of attorney client, I mean, attorney work product privilege. You know, most say, okay, well, I didn't get anything. It, you know, it really took people being like, wait, 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 where's your privilege law? Wait, 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 Let, I need you to tell me, you know, all communications related to this. And so it took a lot of work and it just, it didn't happen for most people. Not even, even definitely the, the minors that didn't have attorneys weren't getting this stuff. You know, kind of like John was talking about when this, you know, when his, the guy he was working with kind of brought the papers and John's like, there should be other stuff here. He's like, nope, didn't get it. Um, but then even when people did have attorneys, often these attorneys just wouldn't do it because it often felt like it was more time required than the likely benefit that you were going to get from it. So anyway. Christine said that you wanted to have questions for us, but I actually have a question for the audience. Is it okay if I ask one? Of course. Um, get ready. One of the things that uh, uh, I found difficult to wrestle with is the role of lawyers in this process. Um, we have a duty on both sides of zealous advocacy for our clients. We have a duty of candor to the tribunal, too. 
Um, and we also are officers of the court and I think a duty to consider the purpose of the statute that we're working under. Now, I don't expect that everybody would agree with that. But I think, and, and particularly I think that, uh, uh, the tension between the duty of zealous advocacy and the duty of candor to the court, um, there's a tension there. And I, I, I've argued, of course, that the duty of candor is a, should have the upper hand, but I can see that there's good arguments otherwise as far as the adversarial system is supposed to work. Um, I just wondered what you all thought about that. Who's in PR now? Nobody? Well, I'll say something if no one else will. I, I think <laughs> having an adversarial system sometimes gets in the way of getting to the truth. and. We have situations where uh, I've read many of the decisions in black lung count proceedings, and the administrative law judge has decided based on how many x-ray readings are on one side and how many are on the other side, which has nothing to do with reality. It has to do with who can pay to get the readings done. Or I've seen, um, you spoke about Dr. Wheeler, uh, and so I've seen uh, opinions from Dr. Wheeler where He's said that the abnormalities on the x-ray cannot be black lung because black lung hasn't existed in the U.S. for decades. <laughs> so anyone that knows anything about this would throw that out. But it doesn't get thrown out because, uh, because he's from, he's Harvard trained. And he also Harvard. said it doesn't look like black lung for this reason and this reason. Exactly. reason. So the rest, the, the judge could say this is crap, but he had these other reasons too. So not only do we have an adversarial system, but we have a system where the decision is made not on the medical basis of the case, not on the merits of the case, but on something else. Yeah. So I guess my thought would be a very high quality administrative system that's focused on getting to the truth and not focused on this adversarial stuff would serve everyone better. Yeah. I read um, in one of the sources for the paper this, there's some notion of having um, a panel of physicians having to come to a consensus on these cases. Um, is, that, is that a possible solution? Does it have pros and cons? Well, uh, the lawyers will, you know, t t from, the, from that point of view, we'll, uh, we'll look at it. From the medical point of view, my personal feeling is that what we really need to do, and, I, and this has partially been done in the most recent regulations, is establish what the current science recognizes as reality or truth. And a panel of physicians should not decide individual cases contrary to what the science is established science, okay? So I'm not sure a panel is a good idea because it will become a political football. We have doctors who say this can't be black men for X, Y, Z, but they don't really have a scientific basis that's accepted by the, by the science uh, community for their opinion, but you know, that's what they say and they're entitled to their opinion. So I, I'm a little bit, again, I am more in favor of having a panel to judge the quality of the evidence. But once the quality of the evidence is sufficient, then the science, which NIOSH has put together in a very excellent review on several occasions, what is the current science in this area, in an objective, independent, unadversarial way. And if that science says, for example, that obstructive lung disease is one of the outcomes of dust exposure and then no individual physician can argue well it was the smoking that did it in this case because that person had sufficient exposure so this is why we're not interested in in getting involved with litigating the science i mean when we uh, agree as a scientific community on the basis of facts and sound medical research that these things exist, we move on. Um, and so it's always sort of flummoxing to me to see that there's arguments about whether 
um, smoking is responsible for progressive massive fibrosis. I mean, it's so absurd um, from a medical point of view that we don't even um, engage in, in that conversation anymore. But it persists. But I guess my point is that uh, a, a panel judging individual cases more than just is this evidence, was it collected in a scientifically valid way? Are these results uh, reliable? But going beyond that, the science should just dictate whether this individual should be considered uh, affected or not. The, okay. the effectiveness of a panel, of course, is going to depend on the um, integrity and the independence of the members of the panel. And historically, there's been a problem with the industry having more influence on the members of a panel than um, rank and file work. As we, uh, I want to spend a little bit of time talking about some of the um, latest policy changes in the law and um, a, kind of as a, just a comment as we transition to that, something that baffled me as I was reading about the legal strategy of some of um, these claims with disclosure of, of medical evidence. Sometimes in a case it would be the strategy to go ahead and award benefits rather than disclose the information and the result of that would make any widow's claim have to start from the beginning because there had been no um, establishment of anything on the record. Um, and so I wondered if you could talk a little bit about um, some of the recent changes in the law that have changed black lung litigation, um, the ACA Byrd amendments, um, there are some presumptions and automatic entitlements in there and how is that um, Playing yeah, out. I'll, I'll jump in on that one. And actually, before I touch on the, the things that Christy mentioned, actually, in my opinion, really the, the legal change from the past 15 years that I care the most about was a what, what we call the dust rule, which was in 2014, uh, the Mine Safety and Health Administration finalized a rule that would that reduces the amount of allowable dust in coal mines. So it kind of reduces the concentration of dust in the air and also closed a lot of important loopholes and in implemented some other things that should mean that the coal miners that are working now as opposed to even you know, a few years back should have less of a risk of black lung. Now I think that there's things about the seams of coal that we're mining and I think that there, I'm not sure that we're actually gonna see that curve change, but legally some things have been done. And I, in a lot of ways, I care more about the dust rule than I do, you know, the rules tinkering with how black lung benefits litigation works because I think primarily I care more about preventing black lung than I do compensating those who have it. But now but turning to the, the second part for those who have it, there was a really, really, really important change in the Affordable Care Act. And I could, we could kind of talk a long time about the Affordable Care Act and black lung and the politics of kind of how all that mixed together. But what I'm talking about is um, there's some specific things about the way that black lung benefit litigation works. It was kind of a small provision that was tacked on. If you, if you are, you know, a real glutton for punishment and decided to flip through the Affordable Care Act and you try to read this and then come away and explain, here's what it does to black lung benefits law, you would fail. You know, you, you really had to kind of know the statute earlier to understand when it says, strike the last sentence, what effect that has. And so the, the two changes, one has to do with um, widow's claims, kind of like Christy was talking about. And that's kind of the easiest one to understand. And uh, the, in the statute, they call it equitable for elegi equi equity for eligible survivors. And essentially, it's pretty straightforward. If a coal miner is awarded black lung benefits, his widow is automatically entitled to her widow's benefits, which is, seems like, sure, that seems pretty fair. If he had black lung enough to get it, then, uh, and she's unmarried and was you know, dependent on him, et cetera, then she should get it. But under the previous system, it didn't work that way. His benefits lasted during his life, and then after he died, game over benefits-wise. The widow has to apply for her own benefits, and she has to prove that the reason he died was due to that black lung. And death causation is just a mess. People have, you know, when people get sick towards the end of their life, there's a lot of things going on. 
and this led to just some really horrible outcomes and a lot of unfairness for these widows. And so that is luckily something that we don't have to deal with as much now. Um, the other thing is there's been this, uh, there was a presumption for coal miners who worked at least 15 years and suffer from a respiratory disability. So you have this kind of subset of coal miners. We're not talking about all miners, we're talking about the people who have a breathing problem and spent you know, 15 years around dusty conditions. And essentially what the law does is it put, instead of making that miner prove that they have black lung and that's why they're disabled, it shifts the burden to the company that's opposing benefits. And they have to disprove that the person has black lung or prove that that black lung has nothing to do with the disability. And hearing that, you might kind of think, okay, it's kind of like a it's a little burden shifting. Maybe if your case is sitting right at the fence post, it you know tips it one way or the other. But practically speaking, it it just it's a real huge difference in how you litigate these cases because the medical evidence is often you know you have this classic battle of the experts. You've got doctors on one side saying no, it has everything to do with smoking, nothing to do with coal mine dust. Or that x-ray is, you know, clear, there's nothing there. And then on the other side, you have doctors saying, yeah, like, the guy smoked and that was bad for him, don't get me wrong. But also, coal mine dust was bad for him and that has something to do with it. And yeah, the x-rays are positive. And then you often have about an equal number on both sides. And so there's a tendency for the judges to kind of throw their hands up in the air and say, well, whose job is it to convince me? Because no one has convinced me. And whoever's job it is to convince me loses. And so it means that for those coal miners that have 15 years of disability, all, I mean, there, there are exceptions, but it basically means those people get benefits now when very often they had very difficult processes. And you see this in the things that have gone through the Court of Appeals of recently. I mean, since for this presumption cases, there has not been a case you know, since 2010 and it's really started being implemented where a coal company has been able to convince the judges that the miner got benefits wrongly. They lose every case. And it, it's remarkable when you think about the experience like John talked about when he was first starting, and also many attorneys that Eric talked about, it used to be the opposite. Every case would go up, the coal miner would lose, and now it, it's just different. And so it means that both for the miners, it's more likely to be worth their time, and then also for the attorneys that want to do this. That's why, like I said, I started law school in 2009 before the Affordable Care Act when I thought, First off, there's not much black lung. Second off, it's not, you're probably going to lose the cases even if you do them. And by the time I was coming out of this in 2013, the case law had clearly totally changed. Now, you know, it's, if I can see a case where the person has 15 years and has a respiratory disability, I'll take it. We can, like, deal with exactly the exposures. We can get into it all. But, you know, there, it's going to be a good case. And... And the reason that presumption makes sense is the work of NIOSH showing that um, it, you know, in those cases it was a contributing factor. And the, the other big legal change um, was in 2000, there were some major changes to the black lung regulations. And we've kind of touched on some of those, but there are really two big changes. I mean, there, there were a lot of changes, but there were two that I think really stand out. The first is... As we were talking about earlier, there used to be this tendency for kind of both just to, you know, dump a whole bunch of evidence in these cases. You know, you'd have scores of x-rays being done, and at, when you're talking about, you know, $80 a pop for an x-ray, if the company submits 40 x-rays, then if you want, you know, if you kind of want to go toe-for-toe -toe in this, then you're talking about thousands of dollars just for, a, again, a relatively modest amount of benefits. And by the way, I didn't mention this earlier, so for a married minor, we're talking about changes year to year. I think it's currently at, you know, $980 a month. So, you know, we're, you know, how many thousand dollars is it worth spending on the front end to maybe get, you know, a thousand bucks a month? Um, and so, so they created limits on quantitatively how much evidence you can put in um, to kind of grossly simplify now both sides can basically have five x-rays. And likewise, you know, you can only go to the pulmonologist basically two times on each side. Um, now there'll still be a lot of follow-up reports and depositions, and there's, that's not to say that when you pick up one of these, you know, the case files are still thick. But, it, but it's something that even with that, even if you're 
even the coal miner doesn't have a lot of money. If you can come up with a couple thousand bucks, you can usually go toe for toe in one of these cases, even with you know the, the most well healed insurance company. Um, and at the same time that they were limiting quantitatively how much evidence you could do, then the Department of Labor started recognizing NIOSH as science. And they started saying it right there in the black lung regulations that the way that we define this disease, pneumoconiosis, includes obstructive impairments. You know, so when, we're, when we have these coal miners that would have you know, COPD, the emphysema, the various the things like that, for much of you know, the 90s, it was, you know, you'd have highly qualified doctors that, you know, would mostly work for coal companies that would just say, coal doesn't cause that. And I can cite you, you know, 40 journal articles to support it, and they would sound good if you kind of didn't really know the science. But they were wrong. And that's what NIOSH clearly documented by 1995, and by 2000, that became embodied in the regulations. So now, when I do these cases, when a doctor says, yeah, but, but the guy has an obstructive impairment. And I'm just like, yes. You know, that's, I can clearly just knock that down and say, the doctor's talking about a disease that's not the disease that the law defines. And so it's, that, has, um, that recognition in there has really made the system uh, much more fair for the coal miners that are going through it. Um. I know we wanted to talk about improvements or changes going forward and ways to improve the system medically or legally. Um, Evan, you proposed an idea in your paper about um, decoupling the medical benefits from the income assistance part of the benefits program. And I was wondering, in the few minutes that we have left, if you could talk about that or if anyone else has any other um, positive, productive thoughts for the future. Well, the, um, so when you get an award of black lung benefits, you know, I talked about, you know, for a, a married coal miner, we're talking about, you know, just south of a thousand bucks a month. But often the more valuable thing is they also get this medical benefits card. And it covers 100% of the cost of all medical treatment related to these respiratory problems. And that can often prove much more valuable than those monetary benefits. I mean, because for example, for a minor with progressive massive fibrosis, there's only one real way that you can deal with it, and that's a lung transplant. Or in, and lung transplants are not done frequently for a whole lot of reasons. But when they are done, then the, the average price tag is about $1.4 million. And so if you've got that card, that's worth $1.4 million for an individual that otherwise could qualify for a transplant. I mean, more frequent, that's, as I said, that, that's not frequently happening. More often we're talking about inhalers, we're talking about pulmonary rehabilitation, and, we're, and we can often be talking about end-of-life care for people who are dying due to respiratory failure. So it's, it's not uncommon at all that the value of the treatment benefits can be, you know, five to tenfold as much as the value of the monetary benefits. And so that's one of the reasons that coal companies and their insurers often want to fight these claims. Because even if you can kind of look at it and say, well, you know, this, this guy's 60 years old, he'll probably live for another 18 years, calculate a thousand bucks per month for 18 years, and his widow gets a little bit more. And you could kind of look at that and say, well, we can just pay that. But then there's this huge uncertainty about, well, what if he dies due to respiratory failure? What if he's hospitalized for three months at the end of his life and they're doing all this critical care stuff? We'll be on the hook for that if we agree to these benefits right now. So there's a lot of incentives to really try to get that claim denied so that you won't have to pay for that benefits card. And at the same time that's going on, you have a lot of coal miners with health needs that don't qualify for black lung benefits. You know, the thing that I think is fresh on many of our memories is a lot of um, the union miners recently, and you know, due to a lot of problems with industry bank bankruptcies, the union's healthcare system was, was underfunded. And so as a result, there was a risk that these union miners who had, who were, had been guaranteed health insurance, they were going to lose that. And so there ended up having to be more, you know, some federal dollars come up to keep that promise that had been made to the miners. And so an, an idea is that, that I've started thinking about through this to both take some pressure off of the black lung benefit system 
and also better serve the coal miners that fundamentally this is about is to decouple the medical benefits from you know the monetary black loan benefits and to find some way that there could just be a more general public health insurance option that could cover coal miners. You know, maybe there's a way that you say if you spend X years in the mines, like often the union pensions would qualify someone for. And a way that that health insurance could then be paid for with some combination of public dollars and industry dollars. I don't think the industry should get off the hook for this because one of the good things about the black lung benefit system is that it requires the industry to at least somewhat pay for the cost of the disease that is fundamentally linked to the extraction of coal. We could, we could talk a whole lot about why that hasn't worked and why the financial incentives have not prevented black lung as much as I think policymakers in the 60s and 70s hoped. But without kind of going to that part of the conversation, um, you know, I think there needs to be some way that the industry continues to bear its fair share of the cost. But at the same time, you know, as we saw with the union healthcare dollars, there's also some value in the public dollars. And when someone doesn't get their black lung benefits, this stuff often falls to Medicare. So the public is often ended up, ends up paying for it in some way or another. And this is still very much at the kind of early brainstorming type stages, but I feel like that that is, could really make a difference in the black lung system and more importantly, better serve the coal miners that, that this is fundamentally about. Okay, well, we're out of time. If, if anyone has a burning question, we can take it, but otherwise I want to try to stay on schedule. Nope. You've all been right. quiet. Thank you so much um, for all of you for being here, and thank you for listening. I know. <laughs> nice job. Thank you. Nice job. I have a question. Can you say that the rates are up?